Harlequins have now become one of the strongest factions in the game of 40k, so I thought we'd discuss what's making them quite so strong at the moment. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In today's video we're talking about the disturbing masked Eldari performers, who can be lightning fast, hit very hard and be utterly frustrating to fight, particularly in the new missions. I wouldn't have predicted it through the midst of 8th edition, but Harlequins have really come into their own in 9th and have been placing very well in tournaments across the world. In today's video we'll talk about why the change to 9th edition has made them so much stronger, talk through their meagre unit options but why they're very good ones, and then discuss their very very scary special rules and absolutely crazy shenanigans that they can do with stratagems. Let's jump straight into it. So throughout the most of 8th edition Harlequins weren't all that strong, they had a brief period where they were a run a bit, particularly when Imperial Knights were so dominant as they could chew through them quite well with Haywire shots. Unlike most armies they didn't get any actual Psychic Awakening book that had new rules for them in, but they did get a bunch of updates in the White Dwarf article, and as White Dwarf updates go, it was actually a really potent update that added a whole load of fun and flavourful options. Their core characters can now gain additional powerful buffing or damage dealing abilities via pivotal rolls, they got a fair few helpful new relics, and also some really powerful movement and redeployment stratagems that could really confound your opponent. We'll get onto the specifics later, but basically all of these were rationed by command points, and with the command point change into 9th edition, Harlequins can very easily fit in just one detachment, which means you have a lot more command points than before to spend on these powerful options. Other changes into 9th edition is increased line of sight blocking terrain and less overwatch in the game, both of which are very good for a fragile assault army, and their excellent movement can often mean that they can stay hidden and then engage the enemy from a very very long way away. Smaller boards can also help with this, particularly as enemies are often going to be wanting to advance into the midfield to take objectives, leaving themselves open for a pretty fearsome counter attack, and Harlequins are on top of that a really good army for scoring the mission objectives in 9th edition whether that's picking up the various mobility orientated secondaries, such as engage on all fronts or linebreaker, deploying scramblers or performing actions with characters, they're also quite resistant to killing type secondaries in their own right, most harlequin lists not really giving up very many points on the kill type secondaries, apart from with characters, which are usually quite easy to hide. The prevalence of space ruins in the meta might not be such a bad thing for them either, it means that people are taking quite a lot of high strength, high AP weapons to chew through power armour, which aren't necessarily all that effective against the high invul saves and minus one to hit modifiers that Harlequins have in abundance. They're also not too bad at killing space marines in their own right either, particularly with Zephyr Glaives on Skyweavers and Haywire Cannons to deal with any marine armour. Not necessarily the strongest against Gravis armour, which is very prevalent, but still could certainly be worse. So Harlequins really have quite a limited pool of units, which often does hamper them in any sort of competitive sense. It does seem at the moment that enough of them are very decent to allow them to break through them. In the HQ section, I'd say one of the pivotal characters is now the Shadow Seer, the Harlequins buffing Psychotype units, and really makes the fragile Harlequin units far more durable than they really should be. Their innate ability, called Shield from Harm, allows them to be minus one to the wound roll on any Harlequin infantry units, so it's a lot harder to kill them than it should be and from a new stratagem from the White Dwarf, you can now apply that to bikes and vehicles as well, which is really quite important on things like Skyweavers, as it would mean that Bolters are wounding them on 5s rather than 4s. On top of that, you can pay a command points to have the pivotal role Veil of Illusion, which can potentially put a whole load of enemy weapons out of range. Units nearby the Shadow Seer count as being an extra 6 inches away from the enemy, which can mean that they're out of range of their guns, and they might not be able to fire at all. It's really powerful indeed, on anything that's 24 inch range or less and can be particularly frustrating on pistols and things out of deep strike. You can combine that little combo with the Shadow Stone Relic, which allows these auras to go off over a 9 inch area, so it means that you can have a fair bit of flexibility with your units as to where they position. Finally, the Shadow Seer is of course a Psyker as well. The Harlequin Discipline has plenty of useful options, Mirror of Minds can do a little bit of character sniping, there's options for a bit of mortal wound output, but in particular Twilight Pathways can be a good one, allowing a Harlequin unit to move again in the movement phase, potentially catapulting a scary unit over to the other side of the board. If there's any way to kill a Shadow Seer if you're against one, then it's probably a good idea. Another unit that can punch far above its weight is the Harlequin Death Jester. They're elite choice characters that can either do a bit of morale manipulation on enemy units, or potentially snipe out characters. Their normal ability will allow you to choose the first model that flees in a failed morale test, and that can actually be really powerful, because if you choose the model that can flee, you could potentially take out a heavy weapon or squad leader, and with the new 9th edition coherency rules, you could choose a model that could break coherency, forcing your opponent to suffer casualties in the coherency check phase, which is really powerful and probably unintended. 
On top of that, Death Jesters can help deny Overwatch with one of their other pivotal rolls, and also give enemies a minus two to move, sorry not to hit there, that was a typer. And there's also the option for Harvester of Torment, which gives you three times as many hits on units with six or more models in them. Any of these abilities can again be further augmented by a couple of Relic Shrieker cannons that are available to them, which just make their damage output that bit better. Rounding out their character choices, you have Troop Masters and Solitaires. Both can be pretty decent damage dealing characters, even if they are a bit fragile. And the Troop Masters Choreographer of War ability allows Harlequin units to punch above their weight as well, by giving them plus one to wound. You can definitely make a Troop Master a scary threat in his own right, with certain combinations of relics, warlord traits, and pivotal roles. He could easily go through a big infantry squad in one turn. So all these characters actually need some units to buff, and there's only really two good ones in the Harlequin's decks at the moment. Harlequin troops are of course the core troops choice, and they typically tend to be fielded in multiple small units in their Starweaver transports. You can either just keep them very cheap and use them as objective scoring and annoyance units, or deck them out with a bit of close combat gear, or a whole clutch of fusion pistols, which can pack a very surprising close range melter punch. You can also run them in foot, typically in larger units, and you can either put them in the webway to strike from deep strike, or think about hiding them out of line of sight on the board, and maybe using them as a bit of a counter attack unit, maybe making use of twilight pathways for them the shadows here. Harlequin troops are very expensive point for point, and they really need to make sure they're not fighting the enemy in any sort of fair fight if they want to have a chance of winning. Fortunately, basically the entire Harlequin dex is designed to make that the case though. Finally, and perhaps the most scary hard hitting unit in the Harlequin dex, are they the unique two rider jetpack squads in the Harlequin Skyweavers? These guys tend to be the fast hard hitting workhorse of the army. They move ridiculously fast at 16 inches and can potentially advance on top of that. They're hard to hit with a baked in minus one to hit and they put out an impressive amount of damage dealing, whether it's through their haywire cannons, which are particularly potent against vehicles, or their zephyr glaives, which can go through space marine infantry with ease. Most Harlequin lists tend to include three units of these things. With all the buffs available, they're just really not a threat that the enemy can ignore. Now we've covered some of the strongest units in the decks, let's talk about a few of the special rules that can amplify them to crazy potential. The Harlequins have the innate ability Rising Crescendo, which basically makes them a foe that's impossible to pin down and have disturbingly long threat ranges. They can advance and charge, fall back and charge, and fall back and shoot. With great movement across the army, they'll be able to hit you from a disturbingly long way away, and you can never tie them down by keeping them in melee. They'll just jump away if they want to, shoot you, and charge back in, potentially at a unit that you really didn't want getting targeted. In terms of their mask forms, I think the two that seem to get played the most are the Frozen Stars, which is a nice flat buff to close combat, and just makes their units a bit stronger by giving them plus one attack on the charge, or potentially the Soaring Spite, which gets a bit more out of their shooting, as it means that their Skyweavers can advance and shoot those Haywire Cannons at no penalty, and their Skyweavers full of Fusion Pistols can advance and still fire those pistols off. Both of them seem to be viable, and will give a slightly different flavour to the list. Two of their more powerful Warlord traits are Player of the Light, which allows nearby Harlequins to re-roll their charge rolls, particularly good if anything happens to be coming out of the webway alongside them, and the other one is Player of Twilight, which gives you the option for a bit of command point farming. It amounts to a 1 in 6 chance of any given stratagem essentially not costing you any CP. We've already mentioned a few of their strong relics, including that Shadow Stone for the Shadow Seer Auras, and the Relic Shrieker Cannons for the Death Jester. Another couple of interesting ones are a suit of hidden knives, which can cause opponents to take mortal wounds on any hit roll of a 1, particularly powerful if you combo it with something that gives them minus 1 to hit, like lightning fast reactions, and it means that you could take out quite a bit of a big unit with that if you get lucky. For making troop masters a lot more fighty, the Twilight Fang also seems to see some play as well. This one's basically a massively souped up power sword that gives him strength 5, so will usually be wounding space marines on 2s, and on top of that you get plus 1 attack per the number on the battle round. If he makes a charge turn 2 for example, then he's going to have an additional 2 attacks. Last but not least, we get into the many and varied, very scary stratagems that the Harlequins can deploy. From the main codex, they can put units into webway assault, so deep strike them, use the Eldar classic of lightning fast reactions to make any one unit minus 1 to hit, and potentially play a bit of hide and seek when they're moving with fire and fade, perhaps allowing them to jump out, fire off a whole load of haywire shots, and then jump back into cover. Between a main codex stratagem and one from the White Dwarf, they have two options for redeploying units pre-game, essentially one command point if you want to redeploy one unit, and two command points if you want to redeploy three. Having these redeploy shenanigans about is really really helpful in 9th edition, as you don't know whether you're going first or second until it's actually been rolled after deployment, so it means that a Harlequin army could potentially deploy everything really aggressively, hoping that they'll go first, and then if they get second turn and they want to hide all their units, 
and they can just do that anyway, maybe redeploying three units of those Skyweaver bikes for example. There's also one to allow your troops to auto advance six inches if you really want to make a very long charge, and a potentially pretty scary one called Chegarax Jest, which you can trigger when an enemy unit falls back and just allows you to shoot at the unit that was in combat with them. Could be very nasty, maybe on some haywire cannons, if a vehicle falls back from them. In terms of White Dwarf stratagems, they have the one command point one to give their characters an additional pivotal role, and such as the Shadow Seer and Death Jester, plenty of these are worth that command point investment. There's that Foes of the Mind one for two command points to allow the Shield from Harm ability to apply to bikes, making them minus one to wound, always good if they happen to have to take a turn in the open. In the fight phase, if they really want to amp up the damage on one unit, then they can use Murderous Entrance for two command points. You do have to use it on the first unit that charge, but this gives the entire unit plus one damage. Not at all bad as quite a lot of the Harlequins units only damage one in their special weapons. It could help them cut through some Space Marines, and you could also use it on those Skyweavers for a damage three Zephyr Glaive. If you attacked and dealt a lot of damage to an enemy unit, but you're worried about them striking back, then you can use the Curtain Force, which is possibly one of the strongest Harlequin stratagems out of this whole lot. After you've fought the enemy in close combat, you can choose to move normally instead of consolidating, which means that you could potentially charge an entire unit of Skyweavers into a threat that they can't hope to kill, deal a whole load of damage to it, and then use this stratagem to just jump back 16 inches away, and leave the enemy completely floundering and unable to deal any damage in return. Finally, with a really nasty trick that you can use on Harlequin troops, you have Twilight Encore. If you're in combat with an enemy unit with a Harlequin troop, and that enemy unit falls back away from you, then you can use Twilight Encore to automatically consolidate your troop 6 inches, which might potentially just keep that unit in combat, and maybe make the troop unable to shoot, or you might even be able to use it to engage a completely different enemy unit. This one has the power to be just ridiculously disruptive, as the enemy is often going to be want to be dropping back from you, as there's not really much sense in remaining in combat with Harlequins, seeing as they can just fall back, shoot and charge anyway. Overall, the Harlequins can bring an absolute ton of scary stuff to the table at the moment, and it's quite interesting to see such a little and fairly neglected faction rise to the top. Hopefully this video has helped to clarify a little bit why they're so good, and maybe might help keep you a bit prepared for if you do happen to face them on the table. Let me know down in the comments below if you have any other thoughts to add to this. Feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics if you'd like to see more similar videos. And if you'd like to keep these sort of videos coming, I'd just like to mention that the channel has a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description. Making all of the content does take quite a bit of time, and I'm only able to keep on doing so as so much of a full-time thing, thanks to the generous support of you guys. If you are interested in helping keep Auspex Tactics going, feel free to give it a look over. Patrons get early access to certain videos, there's regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and you're also automatically entered into the monthly prize draw for the channel with a chance to win some big kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.